Hi, this is Lauren Giesler, Extension Plant Pathologist with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Today we're going to be talking about soybean seed treatments and foliar fungicides. Today in this presentation we're going to be looking through the different foliar soybean diseases and how to identify them. We're going to take a look at an overview of results from our 2011 studies that looked at fungicides in combination with insecticides and in trials at our locations for soybean management field days. Then we're going to overview the common seedling diseases that we see in Nebraska and finally overview the results of the 2011 seed treatment trials that we conducted as a part of the field day series. Now first, when we see foliar diseases, for the most part in Nebraska, these diseases are not developing at significant levels that warrant a fungicide application in most situations. There are some times where we will see that happen, though. Now first of all, we see bacterial blight. This is typically earlier in the season. This is our picture in the upper left corner. And we'll see this during cooler conditions. Anytime we have injury, as you see on that leaf, we'll see the disease develop as it is a bacterial disease and favored by wounding. Now that will typically be in the zone of injury on the plant. So if we have a hailstorm, for example, earlier and then we have new growth after that, you'll many times see that injury associated with the hail injury. Now the most common disease that we'll see in our fields throughout the state, and this is really throughout the U.S. even, is brown spot. Brown spot is a common residue-borne foliar fungal disease and is the one that will cause that early season defoliation and yellowing of the bean canopy lower in the canopy and then work its way up. Now our soybean varieties commercially grown vary greatly in their susceptibility to brown spot, but unfortunately we really don't see any ratings in any of the seed company catalogs, so this is one you'll have to have some experience with. But this is also the disease that I always recommend producers check their fields, and if they're considering foliar fungicide applications at that R3 time, this is something that will definitely give you more of a yield effect if you have this in the field. The third disease on this slide is bacterial pustule. Now bacterial pustule is a disease that we typically see in the upper canopy. It likes warmer conditions, so when we see bacterial pustule, most of the time we won't see bacterial blight at the same time. It has these small lesions that are rough on the underside of the leaf and look like a pustule, almost like a rust pustule. When we talk about identification, and in the past when we were talking about soybean rust, this is one that we would see as a possibility for confusion. But where we haven't seen rust develop in Nebraska, we really don't see that as a problem. But this is the one that will be in the upper canopy. Now, both of the bacterial diseases on this slide are not going to be affected at all by a foliar fungicide application. A brown spot will. The other common foliar diseases that we can see in our fields are downy mildew. That's in the upper left corner. This is a disease that typically in Nebraska we'll see in the upper canopy again when we've got lots of heavy dew events favored by that high moisture availability. You'll see yellow chlorotic spots in the upper canopy and in the morning when we have dew, if you turn those leaves over, you can see the gray fuzzy mass of the fungus actually sporulating under there, which you can see on the left side of that picture set. Now this fungus is also not going to be affected by our foliar fungicide applications. There are fungicides that can affect the downy mildew fungus, but they're not commercially used in our Nebraska fields. The disease on the right is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is also becoming more common, but it occurs primarily when we see overcast, rainy conditions and a little cooler temperatures. This is one that likes the lower light conditions. So we tend to see more powdery mildew when we get really overcast wet conditions, not at all what we're seeing in the 2012 production season. Not really much of a year for powdery mildew, but in other years you may see this. Then the final disease when we look at foliar diseases in soybeans for Nebraska is frog eye leaf spot. Now frog eye leaf spot is becoming more common in the state. It's primarily in the southeastern portion of the state where we see fields that need to be treated actually for frog eye leaf spot, but it is popping up in other areas. This disease will typically be in the upper half of the canopy because the leaves as they mature become less susceptible to the fungus. So it's harder to get those infections. So usually by the time we have canopy and favorable conditions, we'll see that in the upper portion of the canopy as these nice circular spots that have dark purple brown margins. Now frog eye leaf spot will be controlled very well by that fungicide application, particularly with the strobilurin fungicides. So when you're looking at applications in that R3 time period at pod set, frog eye will be one that you'll get control. So if you're seeing frog eye and you're at that time, that's another time that I would recommend considering that fungicide application more as you'll be able to manage that disease as well. There are differences in soybean varieties, and so you'll want to check to see how susceptible your variety is if you do see frog eye develop.
So if we take a look at some of the trial data from studies conducted as part of the Soybean Management Field Day Series in 2011, we've got our four locations at Bancroft, Clay Center, Cortland, and Elba. And the treatments applied at all these locations. We've got our non-treated check where no application was made. We've got the headline treatment from BASF. And then the headline respect treatment, that's the insecticide. And for all of these treatments, we paired the fungicide and then with the fungicide from that company, their insecticide partner. So then with the Syngenta products, we've got Quilt Excel. And then we've got the Quilt Excel with Warrior, their insecticide. And for Bear, we've got Stratego YLD. And then the Stratego with Leverage. And then with Arista Life Science, we've got Avito. And then Avito and Mustang Max. And then the final treatment, we've got just the insecticide Mustang Max alone. So for all of these treatments, these are all applied at R3, which is the pod setting stage for soybean, all applied at 15 gallon per acre. If we look at some of the yield numbers for these different treatments, one of the things that you'll see is that most of the time our fungicides alone would yield more than the check. If we look at our average treatments on the right, the other thing you can see is that when we added that insecticide with the fungicide, we consistently saw more of a yield increase compared to the fungicide alone. So one of the things that we see many producers doing at this time is if they're making that fungicide application, they're adding that insecticide. This is not an IPM approach that we would recommend across all the acres, but we know that it is something that many people are doing as a profitable component of their operation. If we looked at our four locations, one of our sites, Clay Center, has a lot of variability in the yield data and actually you see in that site our check is higher than many of the actual treatments, which could actually happen. But when I look at my variation in that data, I really question if there's something going on there that I can't explain. So if I took Bancroft, Cortland, and Elba and looked at averages across fungicides versus fungicides and insecticides, we would see on average a 2.1 bushel per acre difference of the fungicide versus the non-treated and a 4.1 bushel per acre difference if we looked at with the insecticide. So another two bushel by adding that insecticide at least at those three locations. So overall conclusions from the trials that we had in 2011, and we will be repeating these again this year in 2012. We saw that the fungicide treatments, those all increased leaf greenness and leaf retention at maturity at many of the sites. This is something that is seen a lot of times when we use particularly strobilurin fungicides. We also saw that the combination of the insecticide with the fungicide increased yield more than that fungicide alone treatment and was really in the absence of any significant insect pressure. I also should point out that even our foliar disease levels at all of these was very low. So one thing that we see in our Nebraska soybean fields is that in general our foliar disease levels are below a point where we would be looking at making a fungicide application for just disease control. The other thing to point out is that the results observed in these are very similar to other trials throughout the Midwest region. It's very common to see Fungicide applications hit in that 1.7 to 2, 2.2 range for an increase in yield versus a check when we look at many trials across the Midwest. So now we're going to change gears a little and look at some of the seedling diseases that we see in Nebraska soybean fields, and this would be the common ones for many fields throughout the U.S. First, we've got the Pythium and Phytophthora diseases that are really water molds or fungi favored by really wet conditions. In 2012, for example, even though it's drier later in the season, early on we had some significant rain events where we saw some Phytophthora develop. But again, both of those in soils where we have really wet conditions. Then we've got Rhizoctonia and Fusarium, both of those favored by drier, well-drained soils. With that, Fusarium especially one that hits the root system, as you can see on that picture, usually lower on the plant. And that's what we also see, for example, with sudden death syndrome, where we see that taproot being rotted. So many times fusariums will hit the root system much lower down in the distribution of symptom on the plant. Rhizoctonia, as you can see in that picture, we've got that nice lesion right there at that soil line. We'll see a kind of gray center with a dark margin. Many times that's where we see the infections with rhizoctonia on soybean. And then we'll also see some root infection as well. Now for all of these different seedling diseases, of them, Phytophthora is really the one that we have in soybean varieties that we talk about with differences in the variety and actually selecting resistance. So with Phytophthora root and Simrot, when we talk about resistant varieties, there's definitely specific resistance and tolerance that we'll see in the market of varieties. So selection of variety for those fields with Phytophthora is your first means of managing that problem. 
And then secondly, are using fungicides, and many of our soybean acres have fungicide seed treatments on them, but for Phytophthora, we need to make sure that the metal axle or methanoxum component of that seed treatment is at a high enough rate so that we have good Phytophthora control. Many times when we have fields that we're trying to troubleshoot what's happening, if a farmer has used a standard rate of a seed treatment and we're still having significant stand problems, many times that's going to be due to Phytophthora. The other point to make on this is that many seed companies have their premixed product that they have on their seed that they offer. You just want to make sure to ask your seedsman that that is at a rate that's going to give you good Phytophthora control. And then finally, where appropriate, anything to improve field drainage, that's another option as Phytophthora is favored by really wet conditions. So if we take a look at the average effects of seed treatments at all the four soybean management field day locations, those locations the same as for our foliar trials we talked about earlier, one of the things that we had here as far as treatments were our standard seed treatments that we see in the industry, and these many times are changing, but at least in 2011, these were the main ones out there. We had Syngenta's product, the Apron Max, and then the next treatment we had was the Apron Max with added Apron Excel. That would be the example for a field with Phytophthora. Then we've got the Cruiser Max beans. That has the insecticide in it from Syngenta, as well as the Apron Max product. And then with Bayer, we've got the Trilex 2000. And then the Trilex 2000 with the Poncho Vitivo product. So that has the insecticide, and then that also has the Vitivo part, which is actually a biological agent. And then we've got the Acceleron lineup, and that's going to be with Monsanto. And in this particular year, we've got it where it had the Paracostrobin and the Metal Axle. And then we've got the Acceleron with those two components and the insecticide from Monsanto as well. And then we've got the Cruiser Max beans with Inhibit. Now, Inhibit is a Harpin protein. So there are different companies that market Harpin proteins that can be used as seed treatments, but this one specifically in soybean, and we paired that with the Cruiser Max. That's not a Syngenta product, but it's one that we do see advertised quite a bit for the soybean industry. Then the final product we have is Valence Innovate System, and that's a combination fungicide with an insecticide product from Valent. All of these were applied prior to planting as a normal seed treatment, and all of our populations in these trials were established at 140,000 seeds per acre. One of the things you can see in the data table, if we look at our plant population counts, and these were all determined by counting set lengths of row in each of the plots, all of them replicated four times, you can see that we did have stand effects with many of the treatments. If we're looking at the actual population numbers and then the letters that are behind them, those indicate statistically significant differences in the treatments. And you can see we have some significant effects there for many of the treatments for the populations. But then when we go to the right column and we look at yield, actually we saw no yield effect when we were looking at the effects of the treatments on soybean yield. And this is quite common when we're looking at seed treatment studies. Unless we have significant pressure, and particularly if we're at populations that are well over 100,000 plants, many times we won't see yield effects. As we drop population, that's where we tend to see more effects with yield when we're looking at seed treatments. So the overall conclusions from our 2011 studies, and again, these are going to be repeated in our 2012 Soybean Management Field Day series, and we really did have significant improvement in stand across the treatments, many of them. All of them had greater than 110,000 plants per acre for our averages. And I point that out because, again, when we're at higher populations, many times we'll not see that yield difference because we didn't really see significant differences in yield. That stand didn't relate to that. And I really attribute that to having some of those higher populations in there, even though we established at 140,000 seeds per acre. I want to thank the Soybean Checkoff through the Nebraska Soybean Board really for providing funding for these efforts and supporting the efforts of Soybean Management Field Days where we can hopefully give that information directly to soybean farmers and help them better manage their crop for improved profitability and sustainable production. For more information on soybean diseases and disease management, you can visit the CropWatch website under the Soybean Disease section.